Uh, cool. Can you all see? Great. Um, hi, I'm Michaela. I'm a senior data scientist at Rebel. Um, and my talk today is pretty casual and mostly focusing on how we've built our data science and analytics practice here at Rebel and what the evolution has been from day one with one person on the team to today we have, we fluctuate between about eight and 10 people on our team. Um, so we've seen some pretty significant growth in the last three years. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to be a part of, and I like to talk about it. Um, so I'm a relatively informal person, just give you a little overview of who I am. Um, so I grew up in Woodstock uh, in the Catskills and went to school at SUNY Albany, got my bachelor's in math, and then got my master's in math at a state school in Texas. My first job was at a marketing agency. Um, this is this middle logo is Square is the marketing agency. It's not that exciting. Um, and then I realized that as a marketing agency, they don't actually have ownership of their own data. They're just kind of like pinging into their clients' data when needed, uh, but didn't really give me a lot of freedom to do the types of analysis that I wanted to do. Um, so I started working at an ed tech company called Flocabulary. Um, and then they got acquired about six or seven months into me working there. Um, and they wanted me to move me off of a data science and analytics team. So I moved to Rebel. Um, and at that point, Rebel was super new. Um, so I was one of the first uh, hires on the technology side. Um, and I'll kind of dive into Rebel from day one now. Um, so this is kind of the the growth and the story that I've seen on our team and within the company as a whole. Um, so in 2019, we are just launching mopeds. We are trying to get up and running off the ground. And we are really focusing on exposing the data that we have access to. Um, and then once you start exposing the data that you have access to, you kind of start helping and supporting business decisions that are being made. Um, and then as soon as you start helping and supporting business decisions that are being made, you kind of grow some authority and like gravitas within the organization. Um, and you become more crucial to day-to-day -to -day operations. Um, and so it's kind of this progression. And I don't think any of these are like hard stopping points. Like I think our team is doing all of these things still, um, but you can't really support business decisions without exposing the data. Um, and you can't be crucial to day to day without doing the first two either. Um, so it's kind of like the building blocks that we've created for our team. Um, and I'll go through like the different types of things that we've done in each of these phases and how we kind of grew into the next phase. Um, so the first part is exposing the data that we have. Um, and for each of these, I'll kind of like set the stage for like what the company and the teams looks like um, at the beginning of each of these. Uh, I tried to look for pictures, but I couldn't find any good ones. So we have icons instead. <laughs> um, but the business in 2019 was mopeds only. So we were just launching mopeds in New York City. Um, and as an organization, we were super small, 10 to 15 employees but we we're going through significant headcount growth at that point. Um, so before I joined, I think there was like probably seven people on the team. And then by a month or so after I joined, there was 20 to 30. So pretty significantly increasing the headcount comparatively to what we had. Um, and I was the first IC hire. So we didn't have any engineering teams. There was one other technical person, but they were managing. Um, and so we had data, which was exciting. Um, we were using a third party software uh, to run and own both the consumer app for mopeds and the backend operations app. Um, so we had a Postgres database from all of that, all of the 30 party software app data. Um, and we had some transforms that we were running that were sitting on top of it. 
Um, and we're also pulling in data from Redshift into Redshift from our moped provider uh, as well. So event data like sensor data alerts was all being pulled into a Redshift database. Um, and what were we doing? Uh, we were doing a lot of random stuff, like really just trying to get things out there. Um, while we were launching, literally putting together mopeds in a warehouse, I was sitting in a corner running manual queries to send out daily reports. Um, so really like not necessarily best practice, um, but just like, how do we get this information out as quickly as possible right now? Uh, we set up an EC2 box uh, and did some cron scheduling. That was like the first iteration of not needing to run manual reports, uh, but it was still very ad hoc, no version control, not really thinking super long term. Um, and we have mode is our dashboarding solution. So we're starting to build out the dashboards that we're using um, at that point in time and put some examples up of like what these dashboards looked like. This is a 2019 special. So the map on the left is not actually working anymore because this is an archive dashboard that I pulled. Um, but well, like cool things that we were doing was looking at location data of the mopeds and finding out where were mopeds that are discharged or had a blocking task for us. A blocking task is something that needs to be fixed for the moped to be rentable again. Um, and so this is on the left, like the first iteration of how we support creating an operation strategy. Um, so this was intended to show where are the pockets of mopeds, like high density of mopeds that need fixing. So we're not sending our operation, operations associates to places where they're not going to get a lot of work done. Um, so this is how our team kind of starts like setting the framework for how we can support day-to-day -day decisions. Um, and then there are also things like on the top right, this daily rentals versus ab average operational count. Um, th these are main KPIs and it kind of helps show like, okay, how many rentals do we need to be able to, or how many operational vehicles do we need to be able to support our rental goals that we have? Um, and then on the bottom, this is a, just like a histogram view of uh, battery charge and like where our fleet is at. So it's like 10% buckets of battery charge and how many vehicles are in each of those buckets to give us kind of a state of the system. Um, so there's a lot of work like this that we were doing at that point. Uh, and it, oh, I'm just seeing the questions in the chat. Um, ETL, extract, transform, and load. EC2 is Amazon's like cloud um, computers and servers so that you can run things and not need to have your computer physically on um, or awake to run automations. And then after the chaos subsides somewhat, not really. Um, it, I feel like sometimes it doesn't ever subside. Um, our organization was growing significantly. So in August of 2019, we raised our Series A um, and we hired. Uh, and starting near the end of 2019, early 2020 is when we started like pondering the concept of opening up new lines of business and like, what would it look like if we did something like Rideshare? Um, and those conversations are starting. We're also launching more markets for mopeds. Um, and we started to in-house our technology. So we're building up an engineering team. We are trying to replace the third-party software that we were using for both the consumer app and the operations app. Um, and because of all this in-housing, we're starting to do process improvements on our team. Um, so the data science team was significantly involved in helping create the data model for the new in-house app that we were building. Um, this was super important and crucial for us because it allowed us to make sure that we had everything we needed for reporting, everything we needed for like strategic analysis, um, and everything that we needed to do any like data science or like deeper projects that we wanted to do with the data. Um, we're also kind of starting to integrate best practices into our data science processes at this point. So we're 
setting up GitHub. Um, we are creating transforms with a little bit of documentation at least. Um, and we are kind of getting what we're doing out there into the company a little bit more. Um, and what this looked like in terms of work that we were doing, uh, things that we do are road mapping. So making sure that we are using what we call opportunity or impact sizing um, for making business decisions on what's gonna be worked on. We also in-house uh, forecasting. So daily and monthly rides per active user and revenue per active user is on our team. Um, and that's to support long-term budgeting and daily operations. Um, and then one of the guys on my team, Will, created this thing called CityScan. Um, and this is like kind of one of our cool projects where it is a public a model for publicly with publicly available data to rank and score uh, potential new markets in the US and internationally for mopeds. Um, and so this was the first time that we were using like a data-driven approach to determine new markets that we should be going into. Um, and so it used, you know, census data, demographic data, uh, population density data, uh, I think it was daytime and nighttime population, uh, data on car ownership, all these different factors that impact um, moped like sharing performance. Uh, and stack ranked cities against each other uh, based on estimated revenue from those cities. Um, so we're starting to do like cooler projects at this point on our team, which is really exciting. Some things that I worked on specifically um, are the pricing structure for New York City. Um, so creating models to estimate the impact of adjusting our pricing structure. Um, and what we use those models for was to look at estimated revenue gain, both on a like per ride and forecasted overall basis, um, and to help the business create assumptions on what do we think this is going to do, like impact our users' behavior? So what do we think this is going to do to increase churn, both in a do some users just never come back? And does this decrease the number of rides that our active users are taking because the, the product is potentially more expensive for them? Um, so this was a like a really cool cross-functional um, project that was mostly Excel and Google Sheets based. So at least for us, when you're working with the finance team, it, it ends up that a lot of things are in Google. Um, just because that's what they know and that's where their assumptions are stored. Um, but this was a really fun project to work on. And this is just like a clip of the output. Um, and then we're also another project that we looked at was loyalty. So this is one where we and our team was super involved in the strategy of the program overall. So you know, we know what we want a loyalty program to do, and we're using the data and analysis that we've had in the past to support like the overall organization of this program. So we know that we want to increase the value of our most loyal users, the value of the product to them. Um, so we know that they are X percent cheaper per mile um, due to insurance costs. Uh, and we know that they are higher uh, revenue and rides per active user. Um, so we're using all of this information to both like determine what the program looks like and to determine what thresholds um, count as a loyal user and what thresholds of rides they need to hit, what thresholds of like discounts and revenue they will get um, in subsequent months. Um, uh, some cool predictors of moped use. So population density is super important. Car ownership is super important for us to look at. Um, I think things that you typically think of, of like, where is public transportation used most heavily in cities? Like the predictors of that are also super big predictors of moped use. Um, I think 
the thing, one thing that New York City has above all other markets as well in the U.S. is speed limits, which is interesting. So on most New York City roads are 25 miles per hour um, and our mopeds don't go above 30. So you are riding at the speed of traffic, whereas in, in Austin, for example, roads can go 45, 55, even like, I mean, we don't, you don't, you're not allowed on highways, but like city roads can go up to 45 or 50 miles per hour. And at that point you're going significantly slower than traffic. Um, and so that's an impact on, on moped usage that people don't typically think of. Um, and so I think right now um, we're in a place where we are trying to run two business lines at differing stages of maturity. Um, so rideshare is like the newer business line um, and a little bit more in the like earlier stages than, than mopeds is. Um, and our team is big, like we're eight to 10 people right now, um, which means that we have a lot more capacity and we're doing a lot more work. Um, so right now we're kind of transforming our team into data as a product. Um, so we are more involved in things that are going on in the app itself, um, and more involved in a lot of day-to-day -day operations. So our team owns and manages the pricing algorithm for Rideshare. Um, so there is like a supply and demand based algorithm that looks at how many offers or how many people are requesting rides in a given time frame to determine what our pricing should be at that point in time. Our team also owns and manages rebalancing. So determining where drivers should be moving. These two kind of pricing and rebalancing kind of work in tandem. Um, so it's pretty supply driven of like where are users requesting rides and do we have enough drivers in that location right now? Um, the other thing that we are starting to build out that I'm starting to work on is testing as a framework. Um, so creating opportunities to talk about things that we can test. So marketing campaigns are like a, an easy win for testing because it's really easy to do A-B testing um, and comparisons against. And now we're starting to look at how do we create a testing framework within the app itself and within our product. Um, and so this is kind of like a little bit new, um, but we're building that up in our team. Um, we're also doing data as an infrastructure. So alerting, and this is a big thing that we're starting right now, which is alerting on KPIs um, and alerting on data quality. So both alerting when a, a metric is going outside of our expectation thresholds in either a positive or a negative direction um, and taking the onus of needing to know that or look into that off of our team um, and making it kind of like yell it to both our team and other people across the organization. Um, and this is like, I think super important for at least our team's headspace um, because we don't need to be checking everything all the time to make sure that everything is looks accurate and nothing weird is going on. Um, the other thing that we're working on is data accessibility. So we're working with a company called transform.co. Um, I love them. I will like speak them up to infinity. Um, it's a really cool tool. I'll send the link around. Um, but basically what it does is it allows us to increase data accessibility while also increasing data governance. So our data engineer creates configuration files for all of our metrics. Um, and then it kind of houses a place for documentation on our metrics and allows business users to access those metrics and those values at different granularities with different group buys. Um, it's, it's like a really cool product. Um, and our final iteration of like best practices is moving all of our automations to Airflow. Um, I haven't been super involved in this. It's more on the data engineering side, but I hear that it's doing great things. <laughs> um, 
And then the last thing, these are some cool projects that I've worked on in the past um, months. Um, so been focusing, like myself in the last few months, I've been focusing on rideshare on the consumer side. Um, and my first big project um, this summer was looking at our segment data. So our segment is our event tracking software. Um, so taking all the different actions on the app and storing those as events in our database um, and trying to see all the different flows that we have. So, you know, rating flow, ride flow, sign up flow, all the things that users should be doing on our app and figuring out where the drop-off points are. Um, and typically people will look at that as a funnel um, but in an app like ours, it's not necessarily like a linear flow. Um, and so funnels can be hard to use and somewhat misleading. Um, so we're moving to a transition matrix process now where we're looking at the likelihood. So on the, uh, Y axis is like your first action, um, on the X axis is your second action. and this is showing what's the likelihood of moving from the, the y-axis to the x-axis in your next step. Um, and what's kind of cool about this is you can do matrix multiplication. Um, and in theory, you go to matrix multiplication to infinity, and it becomes somewhat of a static state. Um, and you can see the probability of like, if you start at any of these actions on the y-axis, What's the probability at ending um, on any of these actions on the x-axis at any given point um, in the flow? So it kind of allows us to see, like, if you end a ride, how likely are you to, at some point, both, like, tip and rate? And how likely are you to do that within X amount of time? Um, and so this project has been super helpful in guiding product decisions and determining like where we need to focus on adjustments within the app itself. Uh, and that's been a really cool thing to work on. My current project is predicting user churn. Um, so right now I am putting together a logistic regression model to predict whether or not users are going to return in a given amount of time. Um, and that will both allow us to determine the most impactful factors for somebody's likelihood to continue using the product. Um, and it's going to help us with marketing and communications. So if a, a marketing campaign's goal is to make sure that somebody doesn't churn, if we know that they're going to probably won't ride in the next week, but they will ride in the next eight weeks, Maybe we don't message them because we know that they're going to come back at some point. Um, but if our goal is to just increase ridership from a given user, uh, if we know that they're going to come back in, in one week, but not four weeks, maybe we message them to try and get them to continue riding a little bit more in the next week or four weeks or whatever that is. Um, so I'm really excited about this project and just kind of like in the midst of it right now. Um, doing a lot of exploratory analysis, which has been really fun, um, and looking at different rider behavior, like frequency and recency, um, as it's going. So this is kind of what I've done so far. Um, and I've learned a lot along the way. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I learned is simplicity and communication skills are like unmatched in in a company where you're integrating with business and other departments pretty frequently. Um, and exploratory analyses, even though they're not always like as fun or as cool, they answer most of the day-to-day -day business questions. And it might not be like the hot new topic, but it gets the job done a lot of the time. Um, so thank you. Uh, I saw a couple of other questions come through and I can answer those. Let me just pull the chat back up. Um, marketing messages, it depends. Um, 
promos typically help a lot. So what I mean by promos is credits or discounts. Um, and then managing headcount growth is hard. I think no matter what. Um, so my like arc at Revel was I started as an IC, I moved into management, and then this summer I moved back into IC work. Um, I think I realized that like I'm still early on in my career, and although I do want to manage again at some point, I'd like to do more technical work first. Um, but I think the hiring takes a lot of time, like no matter what to be able to do a hiring process well. Um, it just takes a lot of effort. So managing that was just a lot of communication with the team. Um, and we have daily standups and weekly kickoffs with our team um, and making sure that we're dividing the work appropriately to the people that have the most space. Uh, and if no one has space, it's managing expectations with <laughs> external or non-department people. Um, so origin destination is something that we're looking into and we're going to start looking at um, for rideshare specifically right now. Um, what's nice about rideshare is we have the concept of saved locations. So we have a better idea for, for certain users of what home is and what work is. Um, so it gives us a little bit more room to, to work with that. Um, but I think the most that we've done on mopeds and in the past is looking at like most frequent hexagons um, or like, so we do a lot of work on uh, like using Uber's H3 hexagon um, mapping. And so it's not like most frequent location, but it's down to a hexagon, which is like a quarter mile radius. Um, and we use that. But that's mostly been used as exploration um, rather than anything that we're doing to make decisions right now. Yes, I think that looks about right. I'm just clicking on it. Yes, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, transform.co is really cool. I will probably, I don't know, be a spokesperson, turn into an influencer for them or something. I don't know. I just love them. Um, <laughs> I'm obsessed. Uh, yeah, I think there's always changes I want to see in the data warehouse. Um, I, something that we're working on right now is creating transforms. And I think what I've had to accept over the last few years is the difference between a production warehouse and an analytics warehouse. Um, so when we were creating the data model with the engineering team, we were creating it in, with the mindset of like, this needs to be where we store all the data real time for the app and for like our code base to pull from to do actions within the app itself. Um, and now I've been working with the data engineer specifically to translate a lot of that into like more usable tables for our team. Um, and so we're creating wide tables instead of like star schemas, which I know is like a, a controversial decision. Um, but we are making sure that hopefully the goal is that anyone, even with some SQL skills, can query our databases within the organization. And it doesn't have to only be our team that's owning querying in the database itself. Um, so working with local governments, um, that has been, it's something that we try really hard on. Um, and our policy and government affairs team has worked a ton 
Um, and I was involved in discussions with DOT early on. Um, but I think after, I don't know, 2020, whenever August of 2020, when we shut ourselves down, um, we've taken a more proactive approach on showing what we're doing to try and make sure that we are putting safety first for our users. Um, so educational materials, helmet selfies, um, I don't even remember all of the things that we did at that point, um, but it's always a work in progress. Like, I don't think that's ever going to stop. Um, that's, we have ongoing meetings with the DOT um, just to try and make sure that they understand that we're on the same side for safety. Um, yeah. Um, so scaling the analytics team, I think it's actually been more conservative than scaling the rest of the company. Um, and I think at, at first I was kind of like, that's probably not great. Um, like we should be growing as fast as everyone else. Um, but I think we, when we first hired, we hired a lot of senior folks um, so senior analysts, senior data scientists who can hold a lot of work. Um, and so our team was doing a lot of work at that point. And we didn't necessarily need people. I mean, we needed people, but we were able to manage expectations and not overburden ourselves completely with the team that we had. And it's just been like in the past year where we really needed to scale our team and we've scaled our team while the rest of our headquarters or corporate has not been scaling at the same speed as our team this year. Uh, so there's a little bit of a lag. All right, I think that might be just one last call for questions. I, I wanna make sure Lisa also has time to present her uh, thing, but we had a lot of great questions. So type now or forever hold your peace. All right, um, uh, Michaela, thank you so much. That presentation thank was you. awesome. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm super excited. I'm now going to turn it over to Lisa. I think I made you a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. But as a refresher, uh, Lisa is going to talk about her work at the MTA. Great. Let me share my screen. Full disclosure, I was out sick today and I'm in bed right now. So <laughs> I have a oh. single screen, which I haven't done, like shared a single screen in so long. Um, Thank you for still presenting to us today. <laughs> oh my gosh. Allow Zoom to see your screen. You guys, this is terrible. This is also not the computer I normally use. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Ayanthi, can you pull the slides up for me since I shared them with you? Is that possible? I'm yeah, so sorry. Sure. Let me just uh, get them on my screen and I will pull them up. And if you just. Okay, I'll, I'll start talking while you do that because slides are not important. But um, <laughs> so my name is Lisa. I work at the data and analytics team at the MTA. Um, so today I'm going to talk about like who our team is, talk about the kind of three historic lines of data reporting that we've done which is through the board, open data, and performance dashboards. I will give a deeper dive into our new site, metrics.mta.info, and then talk about where we're going from here. Thank you so much. So yeah, slide three, please. So um, hopefully everyone knows what the MTA is. I'm just going to assume you guys do. <laughs> but uh, the data and analytics team at the MTA, we are a new centralized data team as of this year. So our team's goals are to manage data quality agency-wide, to conduct data-driven analyses and provide data-driven reporting and performance metrics for all of the MTA. 
We are also responsible for complying with the MTA open data law, which requires us to share our data publicly. So these are all pretty big tasks. And I think just like the main takeaway here is that before this year, MTA did not have a centralized data team responsible for any of this. Like, I think there's a lot of talk of like, oh, we are one MTA, we're one organization, but really internally we are not. Like we have New York City Transit, we have two separate railroad companies, we have a lot going on inside and there has never been an effort to centralize any of our work, to set data standards that like the entire company can use. So this is, I think a really cool commitment that like people at the MTA are realizing, hey, this matters, data is important. We should make sure that data is correct and it's coming from the same source. But right now things are a little chaotic in the sense that like, this is a new team where all, well, we have a few people that have worked at the MTA for a while. Most of the staff on this team is new and there's a, there's a big learning curve here. So next slide. Um, so yeah, in my role, I am the acting manager of reporting and analytics. I took on this role in August of this year and all of these projects and work that I'm gonna talk about are things that I have inherited and I also inherited my team which has been a unique experience for me so historically there have been three lines of work in terms of external reporting and sharing data or there's more than this but these are the three main ones I will focus on so we have board reporting performance dashboards and open data and I'll go into a bit more detail onto what each of these three means so next slide um so for those who don't know that much about the MTA, we do have a board. I think it's like over 20 members. This is where I'm trying to hold my tongue. Most of them are like pretty old and are nominated by the governor and or mayor or some of them. I'm not sure how they get there, but they, they are there and we are beholden to their decisions, right? So they have a meeting every month. They vote on whether lines in the budget will be passed, whether policies will be passed. And as staff, we have to provide them with all the information necessary to make those decisions. So a big part of that happens through board reporting. Um, before August of this year, for the committee meetings, which are agency specific, so I mentioned how we have New York City Transit, we have the railroads, each of these agencies would create these huge 100 plus page PDF documents that were manually prepared every single month for the board meeting. You can go find these online if you <laughs> Google MTA board meeting and do like May 2022, anything before August, you can find these just like for the committee books. They are kind of a nightmare. Um, and you'll see what I mean by the next bullet when I say that the data visualizations were not helpful in pulling out trends and that the PDF was not conducive to multiple types of users. In fact, I would argue that it wasn't conducive to any type of user. Like it was very clear to me when I took on this role and had to kind of dig deeper into this that probably no one read this, even though there's a lot of information in there that is really important for someone to know. It was just kind of a nightmare. So if you go to the next slide, uh, there's a image here of a, an example table in a PDF document where you look at this, there's clearly a lot of information here, but anyone looking at this just like eyes glaze over immediately, right? You don't know, you can't pull out trends from this. This is specifically for paratransit and I'm not dogging on them specifically, every agency has the same problem. There's like 20 plus performance indicators here. How are they useful? What do they really mean? You don't know. And I think that there is, we're working on the assumption by providing this that like a board member would know what this means and what to do with that information, right? And I don't think we can assume that a board member or any member of the public would know what to do with this. Um, so this is kind of like the starting point of board reporting. Uh, next slide. We also share information publicly through performance dashboards. Again, this is decentralized by agency and department. And in a fun twist, a lot of these dashboards come from a separate data source than from the board reports. So there are people's jobs who are to check and make sure that the number on the dashboard matches the number that we report to the board. And if it doesn't match, try and figure out why, because there's, again, no centralized data source. There's no documentation of how this dashboard gets created or who's responsible for updating the data. Like the fact that the dashboards or the board book were made 
every single month is amazing to me because <laughs> um, someone was doing it, but it wasn't written down how that was happening. So in the next slide, I had just have a picture of the um, seven currently active performance dashboards that the MTA hosts. These are broken up by agency and department. We even have our own dashboard for elevators and escalators, which is fun. <laughs> um, and so this is something that I think like should not exist. And it's been part of this project's goals to eventually retire these. And finally, in the next slide, the last line of public reporting that I'm currently responsible for is our open data program. So again, this is something that we are legally mandated to participate in. Um, but I, I should say, even though we're legally mandated, I think that this is like the core of how we can actually improve reporting and data use at the MTA. Um, so previously, before this came under the data and analytics team, this was housed under the customer experience department, which I think was always meant to be a temporary home for the, for the program. Right now we have over 62 published data sets and counting. Almost all of these are updated manually. There are very few with an automated data pipeline. And every quarter we are required to publish at least a dozen more. And this is the reason for a lot of my frustration in this job is that we are committing to just like this growing problem. Um, so at the end, I'm gonna do a plug for a job opportunity we have and I would love for you guys to uh, all consider applying. Um, but this is again, like I said, I think a big way to solve for a lot of these issues because if our open data program can be successful and set up well, it can be a source of data externally, but also for our inter internal folks. So um, on the next slide, what did I put on the next slide? Oh, so this project is something again that I inherited in this role and really, I think, took over and hopefully added some new goals for how we can make reporting at the MTA better. So the initial goal of building this site was to replace the manually created board book PDFs that are over 100 pages. Like that was something that was a time sensitive goal. I took on this project at the end of July and they said by September, we need a website that is running and shows all the data that was previously in the PDFs that we need to keep showing and put it online. Um, as you can see from the table that I showed earlier, like there's a lot of stuff in those old board books that maybe we shouldn't be showing this at all. And so we did go through every single board book and reconsider, is this a metric that is important to us and why? Some things were questionable whether it was important or useful, but I think that the MTA operates always with a little bit of fear that if we have previously provided something publicly, if we then take it away, there is a perception that we are hiding something. So we, we lean on the side of transparency when creating this new site and putting up metrics that we previously shared. A secondary goal to this site, and this came later after we had started um, replacing some of these PDFs, is that we wanted to consolidate all of those performance dashboards. So a lot of the data, as I mentioned, that was shown in the board books was actually already shown in the dashboards, but it came from a different source. It wasn't clear if the data owners were the same. And so through this project and by creating yet another dashboard, we wanted to say, hey, let's actually take some things down and not just create another problem. And finally, we wanted to use open data as the source for this new site. Um, so ideally, everything that we share in the board book will live on open data. And I think this will be such a huge step for transparency for the MTA because there are reporters out there who every month go through that PDF or went through it when we were sharing that and would go like type in the numbers into an Excel sheet and that's how they would track data from the MTA. We should just share it. <laughs> like there's no reason we shouldn't do that. And like the only thing holding us back from doing that immediately like tomorrow is just resourcing and a lack of centralized data infrastructure. So on the next slide, um, I just talk a little bit more about how this site was built. So in order to build this, we had to identify and document all the existing data sources and owners. I think I've mentioned this a lot that none of this when we started was documented, whether it was the board book or other dashboards. 
Um, the site is entirely programmed by the data and analytics team in Python using the Streamlit package, which is really cool. Streamlit kind of allows you to use Python to easily stand up a web app and kind of takes over the JavaScript portion for you. So like, I, I don't know JavaScript, but I can make a web page now using the Streamlit package. So highly encourage people to check that out if they're interested. And through the Streamlit package, it's really easy to de develop and maintain visuals. So each page on the website is less than 100 lines of code. Again, I encourage you to check out this site. It is live. It is buggy, so don't look too closely, but it's there. Um, and this site will also be a unified place to view MTA data. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions, you guys. I'm sorry, I'm ignoring you guys. Oh, is Streamlit comparable to Shiny and R? Yes, it is. Yeah. You are um, not boring us. <laughs> okay, great. I really need to figure out how to give Zoom permission to share my screen because I did want to walk you guys through like the GitLab repo if that was of interest. Um, but let's finish the slides first. So next slide is, um, I mentioned, yeah, these were the goals. I think we have checked the box on goal number one where we don't create the old board with PDFs anymore for New York City Transit or the railroads, which is huge accomplishment. Um, goal number two is really my focus through the end of this year and next quarter. Those seven dashboards I showed, they are still live. They're up there for the public to see, which I, I don't like. It gives me a bit of anxiety knowing that I've created yet another dashboard, but haven't retired the old ones yet. And so that's a huge focus of mine in December is to at least take down half of them. And I also want to really focus on making open data used as the source for the visuals. So if you go to the site now, you will see that if the data behind the visual is available in open data, we link to it at the bottom of the page, but we are not consistent about actually like pulling the data using the API to power the visual. And the reason for this is, I don't know if this is gonna be boring, but like the reason for this is that our open data pipeline to actually automate the upload of that data doesn't exist. And so the timing of the release of all these open data sets that need to happen in time for the board meeting is just like, it's too chaotic. We can't do it right now. And so we need a data engineer to help us build those automated pipelines so that we could actually use open data as the source rather than just linking to it. And finally, this is a goal that I have thrown in here and just have like spoken into existence at the MTA is that once we are using open data as a source for all these visuals, I would like to make the entire site open source and like have interested people in the public contribute their own visuals. I think that will be the sign I can leave this job is when someone externally creates a visual using open data, I will be so thrilled. And like, that would just be such a huge win. So we are actively working toward like making sure we have good rules in place in our GitLab, making sure that like, we are setting up things in the correct way so that if we do want an external contributor in the future, it would be clear for them how to do that. And we would know internally how to handle that. So um, next slide. Uh, so yeah, all that to say is you should come work with me. So our team is hiring a data engineering manager right now. I'm the only female manager on the team, would love to see another one. And if you have questions about this role, you can contact me at the email listed. We also will be hiring some non-manager positions in data engineering. So if you are interested in things like helping build those open data automated pipelines, um, helping set up our data lake and managing like a centralized place for data at the MTA, this is definitely the role for you. And I would love to talk about it further. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions. And I'm also gonna try and give this computer permission to share my screen, but I'm not the admin, so I don't know if that's gonna be possible. Um, does your open data portal include geographic data? We have two separate open data products, one for GIS, one for other data, and that's been a pain point for us. So our open data portal does not, and this is such a huge problem. I know just like open, like, throughout the country, whether you're a local government or transit agency is like the separation between spatial data and other data forms on open data portals. So I used to work for um, Bloomberg Philanthropies and did a lot with open data 
like setting up open data programs for city governments. And this is something we saw with even like the best programs nationwide, they would have a separate portal for GIS. And then I don't know, I don't know what the solution is here, but like it, you're not alone in having this be a problem. And that's also an area that for me personally at the MTA, we have not even like touched spatial data yet and thought about how to share that or incorporate that into the open data program. But I'm just trying to take things one topic area at a time. So um, have you thought through adding new data sets? Is it a barrier to get data added to the open data portal? Um, we do have everything planned through the next year and a half of what we're going to be sharing. That was part of the open data law is that we had to think through what we are going to share. The barrier to getting data added to the open data portal is the bureaucracy of it. Like we, we share our data through the New York State portal and it's very difficult internally <laughs> to get signatures on all these forms for people to sign off. There's like the legal team has to approve it, the data owner, all these other people. And it's like a physical or people end up printing this form out <laughs> and it takes like literally months to get all the signatures needed to get approvals to share data on the portal. And yeah, I think I think we have ways to improve this. Like the signatures are one part, but I think getting people more familiar internally with like what open data is, why it matters, why they should use it as the place to access their own data. Like that is something that's definitely a priority of mine next year. And like making sure that the responsibility of sharing new data sets isn't just me, right? Like this should be more on the data owners and they should have more ownership into the process, why it matters and like participate more. Are there internship opportunities? Yes, there are. Um, I think if you like Google MTA internship, <laughs> it's a separate portal, separate from the career page. Um, but we do have an intern, we are hiring interns for my team. So if you are interested, please apply. And I'll put my email address in the chat as well for those who um, have questions or can't find a job description. Um, do you work with managed turnstile data at all? Oh my gosh, that data set is my nightmare. <laughs> um, so I don't work with it. Wait, sorry, I'm typing my email and I can't do two things at once. Please send me feedback. Um, turnstile data. So we do have some turnstile data on the open data portal. And this has been a data set where Again, like I inherited this program and then I'm like, who's the data owner for this? No one has this written down. It was somehow getting updated. And I finally found who that person was a month ago and then realized, oh, this is actually being shared through MTA's developer site, which is where we host things like our real-time data. And like, again, we are not centralized. <laughs> These are all things that should live in one place, but we do have our real-time data and other data sets available on the MTA website where you can agree that like you're not going to use the data for, I guess, some bad purpose and then get access to it. And that's where you can access our turnstile data. I would love to improve the way that it is accessed through the New York State portal and also just generally improve things like our data dictionaries and make sure that like data sets are legible to a broader audience than maybe they previously were. Because even like for someone who has worked with that data a little bit, it's me trying to find someone who's worked at the MTA forever and be like, what does this field mean? What should I know about this? And this is all stuff that should be documented and shared with the public. Um, okay, so Melissa's question. I work at King County Metro and often we don't publish all our data in our open data portal because it's such a pain to get it uploaded especially during COVID, speed and reporting was more important than sustainability for data. Yes, <laughs> I, yeah. And I think I even feel this with like this specific project that I've shared where the speed of trying to replace the board book and saying like, you have two months to stand up a new website and also here are all, all the other things that should maybe be thought of. Like if we could have done this correctly, I would have loved to first fix the open data sets 
make sure that pipeline was in place and then build the site on top of a reliable data source. But we've done we've done things backwards, which I can understand there's always some urgency that's going to help move things along. But like we started at the end of the pipeline of fixing the reporting part and not fixing the data pipeline first. Um, so let's see. Oh my gosh, yeah, you forgot it. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds terrible. I think so. One thing with like the centralized data team is we're really trying to be better about like making sure our data is going to be shared somewhere centralized where other people can access it, right? Like a lot of people at the MTA can do analysis. It's not just going to be our team of data scientists, but we want to have the source of data so that people, when they run analysis, they're not fighting over which number is correct because it came from the same source. And that's just something that happens so often is two people do a calculation and you get two different outcomes because the data source is different. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone else have questions? Does this end at nine? Did I go over time? I think you're good for like a few more minutes. Um, okay. Like I tried to give each person like half an hour to do, and I think you cool. started around 840, so you have a few more minutes. Does our team also QC the data? So right now, no, because we don't have that centralized infrastructure set up, but that's something that I've been thinking a lot about is how we make sure that in our data lake, we are like, that the data quality part of the process happens before it gets to me who's putting it on the open data portal, right? Like this centralized data source, we need to have something that is clean and has been checked for quality before it gets to me and then I'm the catch. Like that shouldn't be the case. <laughs> that sounds like a terrible job. Um, but right now our team, I guess, does QC the data in the sense that we see a lot of the stuff that's going to the board or going on the public website and we can say like, hey, this doesn't look right. And that's like about all the QC we can do because like I personally am not a data owner, right? I've just set up the site and like I'm trying to make things automated, but I'm not familiar with exactly like the nuances of each data set. Is our team responsible for NTD reporting? I don't know what NTD stands for, so I'm gonna hope that we're not. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't think we are. I hope we're not. Maybe I should ask my boss about that tomorrow. <laughs> so I personally don't work with GTFS data. Um, maybe to give more background on like the data and analytics team. So I'm very much like the end of the pipeline of like reporting and analysis and analytics, but we do have we're hiring that very beginning part of the pipeline, right? The data engineering part. And then in the middle part of like data scientists, those are the people that are really working more, more closely with the data. And so they have some things built off of the GTFS feeds. Um, yeah, if there's no more questions, it was great to meet everybody. Hang on, I think there's, what is your team tech stack in the chat? tech stack like like what software like, that we use like all the tools like python sql r um mostly python uh, we do most uh, many of our new hires were actually like more fluent in r so i'm curious to see how the tables will turn <laughs> on that front but yeah like this streamlit app is Python. Most of our stuff on the reporting side has been built using Streamlit. So like this project I talked about is just the external version of this site, but we do have an internal version that uses data that we can't publicly share for whatever reason, privacy concerns, or just like the quality is not good enough yet to share publicly. Um, and yeah, I don't know, like MTA is a Microsoft organization, but for some reason we use GitLab for our code because 
that seems like something an oversight by somebody but yeah mostly python and oh for the like data engineering side we've been working with a synapse and a zero data warehouse but you guys i'm like not a tech person in my background so i'm just here for the ride <laughs> was that a intended pun here for the ride <laughs> it was but i guess that that's a something i should mention though is like like i'm a manager on the team but my background is not in programming like i i I took one R course before I took this job. And I think the reason why I got this job is because there's such a need for like the political aspect of data at the MTA, right? Like the, if you check out the site, metricsmta.info, it's like just some line charts. Like I know how to make a line chart in Python, I can do that. But like, <laughs> like really difficult programming things, that is not something I'm capable of doing. But I think that like what the MTA needed at the time that this team was forming was someone who was able to communicate like why all of this was important right like why does open data matter how can we use it to better centralize so many other data processes or like like this data engineering role that i shared i think that while having someone who is like a competent data architect is going to be important i think the more difficult part of that role is going to be working with working with MTA IT and figuring out like where where do you draw the line in terms of like this is my responsibility and this is something that has historically been MTA IT's responsibility right and these are all like these are people problems not data problems and so I'm hoping if any of you guys are interested in the role like I would encourage you to think about the people side of your skill set as well as the technical side. Do you work with a vendor outside if you have dashboards up? Um, I'm not sure what you mean. So like this, this dashboard is built entirely in Python and it's like in our GitLab and we don't need an outside vendor to support it, right? Like, which is I think really cool that we're able to do this all in house. Um, and we have other people outside of our data analytics team that are fluent in Python who will be adding their own visuals to the website and they're part of data teams and other pockets of the MTA so we don't need a vendor to support it and I think that's been like a huge benefit of building all of this in house and something that's really unique to working at one of the largest transit agencies in the world is that we do have like such a variety of staff skills that we are able to build something internally. Okay, I think that's everyone's questions. I don't want to take up too much of people's time. It's been a little over an hour now, and I think you you each gave like half an hour presentation, but I know it's late for people. Um, thank you to both of you. Both those presentations were incredible. Um, as people may or may not know, like I love transportation. That's what I went to school for. And even though I don't work in it now, I'm still like obsessed with it. So thank you to both of you. I think it was cool to have like two different sides, the the government side and the private side. Um, so this talk has been recorded and it'll be up in a little bit. Um, but thank you to everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. And thank you to Michaela and Lisa.